share this out with others who weren't able to attend today. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the latest installment of the Iowa OER webinar series, where we cover topics that are relevant to people embarking on OER, open education projects. If you have topics that are of interest to you in these webinars, you can always send us a message through the Iowa OER Google group, which you can find on our website or just you know by searching Google groups. And you can always um, just send us a message on any you know any kind of topic that you might want to hear a webinar about. So my name is Mariah Burnett. I'm the scholarly communications librarian at the University of Iowa. And today we'll be hearing from some people from outside the state. And I imagine some of the audience is from outside the state as well. So I'd like to welcome everybody um, and, um, and just say hello to everybody who we haven't seen before. I'm joined today by a panel of librarians who will discuss course marking for OER. So course marking allows students to see in course catalogs and other kind of course lookup systems if the class that they plan on taking uses free or low cost resources. And this can be a good way for students to kind of know what they're getting into in terms of um, textbook costs. It can also help kind of move the needle for, um, for OER use on campuses. So our first panelist today is Jessica Kirshner, and she is the Open Educational Resources Librarian at Virginia Commonwealth University, where she leads the library's open and affordable content initiative and supports faculty in the adoption, adaption, and creation of free course materials. She's the co-editor of Marking Open and Affordable Courses, Best Practices and Case Studies, she serves as the managing editor of the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication and is currently a Library Publishing Coalition board member. She began her career in the acquisitions department at SUNY Press and later served as digital publishing librarian at Texas Tech University, where she worked on developing an affordable digital textbook publishing program. So Jessica will give an overview of course markings, including implementation using information from her book. And she'll also talk briefly about course markings at VCU. And so hopefully she will be followed by um, Rebel Cumming Sauls, who serves as the Director of Digital Services and Open Educational Resources for the Florida Academic Library Services Cooperative. So Ms. Cumming Sauls has more than 10 years of experience in higher ed with over six years in academic research libraries. Prior to her appointment with Florida Academic Library Services Cooperative, she served as the Director of the Center for Advancement of Digital Scholarship for Hale Library at Kansas State University. And prior to her appointment at Kansas State, she served more than three years as library operations coordinator for the Tampa Library at the University of South Florida. Rebel will be presenting on the similarities and kind of contrast the differences between initiatives at an institution level and sort of state efforts. So, um, so that's kind of what Rebel will be talking about. And then our final presenter will be Nathan Smith, who is the OER coordinator and philosophy instructor at Houston Community College. He's been teaching at HCC since 2008 and received PhD in philosophy from Boston College and the University of Paris Sorbonne. He's been working on ed open education since 2012 and has helped to implement HCC's Z degree program, managing a grant initiative since 2017. Prior to that, he was the chair of the philosophy, humanities and library sciences department. He's written and presented on a number of different areas in open education. And Nathan will be providing a practical example of how course tagging systems get built into PeopleSoft. So um, I'd ask that everybody keeps their microphones muted until the Q&A period or until the discussion period. At that time, you can just feel free to unmute your mics and, and just you know shout out any questions that you may have. You can also type your comments into the chat too, and we will um, and we'll be able to, to ask questions at that time too. So um, once again, the whole session will be recorded. We'll post it to the Iowa um, OER's uh, YouTube channel after this um, session. It should be up later today or early tomorrow. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Mariah. Let me share my screen. All right, y'all can see my slides okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, so as Mariah said, I'm Jessica Kirshner. I'm an OER librarian at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and I just wanted to start us off by giving an introduction to open affordable course markings. Um, we have implemented course markings at VCU, um, although they went into effect right when the pandemic started. So um, they've been put a little bit on the back burner <laughs> with everything else going on. Um, and as said in my bio, most of my expertise actually comes from, uh, there we go, um, my work as co-editor of um, 
marketing open and affordable courses. So uh, most of the stuff I'm going to cover today, except for a couple things from VCU, um, comes from the book. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, there's a lot of information in the slides um, that I'm not going to go over all of it, um, but it's all in the book. Um, I'm also happy to share the slides. Um, the book contains a number of chapters on best practices, things like, you know, stakeholders um, and communication, um, and also nine case studies of which uh, Nathan and Rebel um, are two. So uh, what is course markings? I know Mariah gave us a, a brief introduction, but um, I wanted to go into this a little bit more. Um, so uh, they also might be known as course designations, um, attributes, um, or tags, basically just means assigning a specific searchable attribute to a course. So think of things like if you need a writing intensive course to graduate if you're looking for an honors course. Um, they can look like a variety of things. There's really not a set um, what it looks like. Um, we're talking about marking open and affordable course markings. Um, we're talking about indicating whether a class uses um, low or no cost resources. Um, so this can be, for example, in the course attribute field, like you can see here from UT Arlington, um, and then should also show up in the results page, um, like this example from Connecticut. So at VCU, like I said, we've implement, implemented course markings um, similar to the, the UTA model. Um, it's an attribute field. Um, and then again, we'll show up in the course list. This last column is, is an attribute. Uh, as attribute columns, you can see it's listed low cost materials there. Um, so I wanted to, to spend a good portion talking about uh, preparing for course markings. So you decided this is something you're interested in. How do you get from you know the idea of course markings to actually implementing them? So um, in the book, uh, we have a chapter about preparing for implementation and we list a lot of questions. Um, I know there's a lot of text on this. Um, page. Um, but basically, um, you know, important questions that you should think through, um, you know, try to have answers before actually um, marking because they'll kind of guide how you work. Um, and because there's a lot of text, you know, they're, they're kind of broken up into these five categories. So, you know, thinking about what the markings will look like and what they'll represent, um, you know, how technologically it'll be implemented, um, how it'll impact impact processes um, and staffing? Um, are there any requirements you need to meet? Um, and then how are you gonna communicate what you're doing with the broader population? Um, we recommend that you do an environmental scan to kind of um, assess what your situation is at your institution. Um, part of the reason there's this long list of questions and not a step of, you know, do one, you know, then do two, is because it's really gonna depend upon your institutional context. So understanding what your institution, um, how these things work your institution and how they'll be impacted is important before you can make a plan for moving forward. Um, so whether or not you actually do the environmental scan, it was up to you, but kind of understanding, um, you know, these, these different processes is, is going to be important. Um, but I wanted to go over kind of the big considerations that we talk about for the environmental scan. So the first is motivations for course markings. Um, and these are, this is important because motivations can shape implementation. Um, sometimes you'll be moving from legal um, requirements, um, your administration might want it, then you might have more rigid about how you're going to implement. Other times there might be more flexible. Um, there is increasing number of states that are passing legislation. Um, but as you can see from the last column in this table, it really isn't uniform. So there's some states ask for OER, some ask for no or low cost, um, some define it differently if they define OER at all. So really looking to your specific legislation to see what requirements are is important. Um, at Virginia, they require basically three things. So uh, that all public higher education institutions implement the markings, that the markings uh, basically identify conspicuously in the online course catalog or registration system. So some uh, institutions you know, make independent lists with just a list of all the courses that are using OER. In Virginia, you have to actually put it into your registration system. And then last, um, Basically, you have to mark for no, or, no cost or low cost materials, but as you can see, they don't actually provide a definition for what low cost is. Um, at VCU, we went the policy route. So basically, we wrote that into our policy. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty close to what was quoted on the previous slide, the conspicuously identified is the key phrasing there. So in addition to motivations, I should think about current and open affordable awareness and activity on your campus. Because 
how much people are aware, uh, invested in these kind of initiatives can influence how the markings are rolled out. Um, it can influence what you call the labels. If people know what OER are, it might be okay to use that. If no one does, uh, using OER as a label might not mean much to campus. Uh, if there is a lot of interest in open and affordable course content, people could be accepting of this. Um, otherwise, you know, if this is something new, there might be resistance to marking. And then if you have an OER committee, um, it might be really helpful to involve them. They'll be involved, uh, already have a number of stakeholders which are important to involved with the process um, in that committee so they can help, you know, reach different people, um, you know, conduct environmental scan, promote implementation, et cetera. Next, uh, you need to learn about your current information, student information system. Uh, so, you know, art course marking is technologically possible. It's easy to make edits to the system. Is there a place in the back end that you can just rework to mark course markings? Um, you know, how, is, how easy is it to change? Are you able to do it in-house? Um, also maintain it in-house. You have to also think a little bit long-term. Um, and then because course markings are becoming increasingly popular, there are some systems that, you know, might have it already in place, or there might be people who have implemented it on your SIS that, um, that might be willing to share what they've done. Similarly, uh, building on that, I guess, um, in addition to, to SIS, excuse me, you just think about processes. So not just the actual technology, but the technological processes and also human processes. Um, and these processes are going to be different institution to institution. So really understanding what they are at yours um, before you can understand what needs to change um, and how difficult those changes will be. So Basically, there's three different parties involved in these kind of processes, um, and I adopted this from an open art organ webinar on course markings, which I also highly recommend you check out. Um, it's very useful, but basically there's the instructor, you know, the person teaching the course, the schedule uh, might be known as the registrar, uh, schedule is kind of a catch all term here, and then the campus store. So there's this, you know, course reporting structure between the instructor and schedule letting know who's teaching courses, uh, departments might also be involved there too. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, there's an instructor reporting course materials to the campus store. Excuse me. Um, and then the schedule on the campus store may or may not talk to each other. Um, so each of these processes, in order to understand, this slide has some additional questions. So you can see I, I inserted department in here as well. So things like, you know, on the course creation, the course catalog creation side, who's deciding, how is that reported to the schedule? On the other, you know, again, who decides, how is it reporting, who are they reporting to? Um, and then, you know, investigating further the relationship between the schedule and the campus store. And then last, uh, the questions in red on this slide are added to uh, for course marking. So, you know, starting with instructors, how do instructors know that they need to report open and affordable course content use? Um, and then thinking about, you know, how is it going to be reported to the schedule? How is it going to show up in the schedule? Um, how is it going to be reported to the bookstore? If at all, um, it might not be. Um, and, you know, again, are the schedule and campus store talking to each other? Are they uh, sharing this information and how? As you can see, there's a lot of uh, things involved with this. So it's no surprise that even if you have a plan for moving forward, processes might be a little uh, potential problems along the way. Um, so I mentioned there's different processes uh, and each institution is going to be different, but individual institutions might also be different. So you might have departments that are working differently at your institution. So implementing one set process might not work. Um, so kind of thinking about that and how to adjust. Um, timely reporting of course materials can also be an issue. If you talk to almost any bookstore manager and they'll complain you know, that they don't get adoptions on time. Um, I work with our bookstore on a, a separate project where they send me lists of adoptions and our adoption deadline for spring is October 15th, but I'm lucky if I get you know, a good percentage by November 15th. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for delayed reporting. You know, instructors might not even be assigned courses to teach at that point. So uh, it's whatever the reason, you know, it, 
the reporting might not happen before the registration um, occurs, which is, you know, when marking needs to occur. Um, and the similar vein, you know, courses might change, instructors might change. Um, so if they're already being marked as OER courses or, you know, no or low cost courses, um, how do you change that if that, that doesn't happen anymore? Um, there could also be misreporting. So faculty, you know, clicking a wrong button or saying they have OER when they're actually using no cost uh, resources, so not totally understanding what they have to report, um, you know, how do you fix that um, or educate further. Um, and then last, you know, mixed messaging and student confusion. So one of the case studies in the books talks about how their bookstore sent a message to students that they had no required textbooks. But on the other hand, uh, they got to class and they had an OER. So the students were annoyed because they had still the textbook, even though the bookstore said they didn't. So ensuring that, you know, messaging is consistent to uh, minimize confusion for students. Um, and similarly, thinking about processes, you have to think about staff capabilities. So as you change these processes, how are staff going to be impacted? Um, and current, current staffing cover the change? Or are you going to need someone new to kind of, you know, fill in the gaps by these extra steps that are going to need to be taken? And along those lines, um, you know, if additional staffing is required, where's the funding coming from? Um, if you need to make changes to the SIS, how much is that going to cost? Um, there are a number of schools in Oregon that all use the same SIS that uh, banded together um, to pay to contract out to the vendor to make the changes because it was more cost effective to do it as a group than to do it individually. Um, in addition to the direct costs, you think about the labor costs, you know, the additional workload, um, how is that going to change? Um, and you might not be able to quantify all these costs before you start thinking about, uh, before you actually implement, but just, you know, being aware that there are costs associated with it, um, so you're not caught off guard down the line. So I also wanted to briefly talk about labeling the markings. And as I said, you know, markings can kind of be anything you want them to be, so I'm just going to touch on the three three popular ones. Um, so the first is OER. Um, this is great um, if you're interested in tracking you know, OER usage, the impact of OER classes or initiatives. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's always the question of whether faculty and students understand the term OER. Um, you know, if they don't, will classes be reported correctly? Um, and you know, on the other side, will faculty or will excuse me, will students be able to interpret the mark correctly if they says OER and they don't know what that means? Is it actually going to impact students at all? Uh, not, oh, sorry. Uh, this example from from the book um, from a community college in New York. Um, they do use a definition of OER, but they provide this explanation of what OER are in uh, alongside the course, so students have this additional information when they're registering, which could be helpful. But again, you don't have to think if that's something you want to do and what your definition is. Uh, next, there could be, you could use no cost or zero textbook cost, uh, Z degree could also be along these lines. You know, this is easier to understand. If you say to someone, uh, use the no cost course, they're not really going to have any questions. Um, there's also the potential for more resources. You know, at BCU, we do a lot of work with library license content, um, and that could be included here, um, which is great, especially for those courses that don't have any OER. But, you know, if you're specifically looking to measure OER usage or impact, you're not going to be able to do that because OER are going to be grouped with other no cost resources. And third, um, you could use low cost. So again, this is easier to understand. Uh, you know, low cost, people are going to know what you're talking about relatively, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, and it can also include a broader range of resources um, like courseware, which may be necessary, especially for larger classes. But again, you know, if you're looking for tracking OER specific things, it's not going to be helpful. Um, you potentially could support the publisher ecosystem. So you have to think about your values. Um, and then there's also this question of how you determine the low cost threshold. Um, and on top of that, how do you calculate cost? Is it new books from the bookstore? Is it used? Is it rental, um, et cetera? So Nicole Finkbeiner from formerly of OpenStax um, put together this uh, survey while she was there where institutions could report if they were using, mark, uh, using open affordable course markings um, and if they were using low cost, what their threshold was. Um, and as you can see, $40 ended up being overwhelmingly the most popular response and has kind of emerged as the national standard. 
Um, and it's not clear how people get to there. Um, some people I think do get student feedback at VCU. We just kind of looked and said, that's what other institutions are doing, we'll do that. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd highly recommend checking out this resource from Washington Community Technical Colleges. Um, they have information on the survey they did to come to their low cost threshold, which was $50. They also have detailed um, guidance on how to determine costs, like I was talking about, you know, using uh, new books, used books, et cetera. Um, so it's a great resource and I highly recommend checking it out. Um, last, I wanted to briefly touch on some key points and trends to wrap it up. Um, so when talking about course markings, it's important to center transparency and student agency. So it's about giving students who, you know, have those financial questions, who might be concerned about their finances, the information they need to make informed decisions about uh, their academic careers so to ensure they can succeed. Um, you know, it's not forcing professors to do anything. When we started um, talking about it at BCU after the legislation came out, I had a bunch of professors come up to me, you know, scared that they had to use this. How are they going to transform their classes? Faculty don't do anything. They can continue doing what they were doing before. They just won't be marked in the course catalog if they don't meet the requirements. Um, it's really about students and ensuring students have the information they need. Um, and along those lines, you know, it's important to communicate clearly and often um, to people understand the markings are there, what they mean, and how to use them. And then, um, as I mentioned before, every institution will be different. So it's important to kind of know what you're, you're dealing with to know how to move forward. Um, Implementing course markings is going to require collaboration between a number of stakeholders. We have a whole chapter on this section uh, on stakeholders in the book, talking about um, you know everyone from advisors to IT to administration to librarians. Um, I'd highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's okay to be a bit iterative. Um, you know, you can set something up at the beginning, might end up changing along the way. Um, Nathan does a really good job of talking about that in his case study in the book. I'm not sure if he's going to talk about it today, but if not, I highly recommend checking out his case study in our book. Um, and then last, uh, impact is still emerging. So, uh, you know, we have a chapter on impact in the book, but it was the hardest one to write because there's really not that much. Uh, one of the case studies talks about wait lists being longer for their Z degree marked courses, but we really don't know um, how uh, course marking impacts enrollment or student success or anything. So it's still a relatively new field and we're, we're figuring out uh, how things uh, are impacted in the long run. So that's it for my section of the presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to, to Rebel or Ethan. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. Does anybody have any questions for Jessica before we turn it over to Rebel? Okay, you're on Rebel. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I have to first um, apologize because the device that I was gonna use to screen share with you all has now gone compute. So I'm going to <clears throat> share through my screen. Oh, where is it? Okay, can you see my screen right now? Not yet. Okay, hold on, let me try again. Try to share one more time. Screen, start. And... Oh my God, where's the, okay, let me try to share the link like that. That's it. Do you, Nathan, do you want to go real quick and let me try to see what's going on with my device? I can do that, Mariah. That if yeah, you, that works. Mm -hmm. And if, probably, right. if it's if it's just not working, you can always send me an email with the slides and I can just display them from this end too if you want.
Okay, so let's see here. If I do that, does that look right? Sharing the correct screen. We're good, thanks. Okay, well, um, I this actually works out pretty well. I thank you so much, Jessica, for that presentation. I feel like your presentation was had so much detail and wonderful advice um, that uh, you know I'd be happy to give you more of my time um, just to listen to you talk about it. Um, so what I'm going to do here, though, is maybe try to hit on some of the same topics that Jessica talked about, but kind of just talk about it specifically with respect to um, how we implemented course marking at Houston Community College. And I will go ahead and talk a little bit about kind of our the process. Um, I don't do that in the slide deck so much, but I can just talk through it a little bit. Um, so, all right. So first of all, we do have a Z degree program. Um, that is a program that was uh, started in 2017 through a grant. And, um, you know, I think the the fact that we offer a Z degree has uh, in some ways shaped some of the decisions we've made in terms of course marking. Um, we certainly have uh, have emphasized the zero cost option and kind of and made the the decisions around course marking sort of center around that cost um, factor. We allow courses in our Z degree to be taught using um, OER uh, free. Uh, materials that are either acquired through the library or through um, you know open access kind of materials and we also um, subsidize the use of some oer courseware so that's um, you know uh, for-profit companies provide sort of wraparound services around oer so that they really mimic and look like the kind of um, the kind of publisher lms and homework management systems that um, many faculty have become accustomed to, we do subsidize some of that in, in order to make it zero cost. So all of those things are lumped in into our zero cost uh, structure. So what I'll say for in general, when you're thinking about course tagging is the most important thing to start with. Um, thank you, Abby, for comments in the, um, in the chat here about zero cost degree programs. I think the place to start though with your, um, with your course tagging project is is a strategic place like you want to think about um, where like why are we can why are we tagging you know maybe it's it's driven by um, you know a state uh, mandate or an institutional mandate of some kind At, in Texas there is a state law requiring o, OER tagging um, but it's pretty general I think um, the requirement is only that we provide a list of of the resources um, in a in a way that's similar to the the resources that would be provided through the bookstore, so you know uh, there's a fair bit of flexibility that you have in this um, in, in many of the cases um, depending on the law and depending on your policy at your institution. So there are trade offs to each of these things, um, as Jessica talked about. You know, OER, I think on the one hand, um, you know, gets you, you, you know what you're looking at, but then you have to monitor that. Um, I've always thought that if you had an OER tag, you'd, you'd better have someone making sure that a certain percentage of the resources are, um, are in fact openly licensed. Um, zero cost is a little easier, but then you have the confounding variables of sort of open access and potentially subsidized courseware and all of that. Who is your audience? Um, I think primarily that's going to be students, but you know you ought to think about uh, your administration and as well as our board of trustees is very interested in this project as well. And what are your priorities as far as the the program? Uh, for us, the priority was to highlight our Z degree um, and then also to track, um, have an easy way of tracking data. Um, we uh, we so. Um, we started with a low cost um, option or a low cost tag. And let me just go ahead to the next slide and show you kind of where we are with that. Hold on. Yeah, so currently we have kind of a, a big umbrella program that we're calling our textbook savings program. And that includes our Z degree, 
zero cost books. It also includes low cost books, which we define as less than $40. And we even go to a little bit more detail. We say less than $40 when purchased new at the bookstore. So, um, you know, that, that is an, that's a metric that we can, we can, you know, make sure is uniform. Um, and then we also have an inclusive access uh, partnership with uh, Barnes and Noble, who is our bookstore vendor. And as you know, the sort of inclusive access has kind of grown quite a bit. Um, recently, we have tried to kind of integrate our inclusive access program with our OER program, even though um, in, in some ways those, those things are, uh, there's a tension between them. Um, so I try to diagram this with the most um, complicated possible Venn diagram, I think, um, over here. Um, but this is really just meant to show the relationship between these categories. So as you can see, you can have things that are zero cost or in the Z degree that are not OER. Um, similarly, there are OER that are low cost and there are OER, in fact, we have some of our OER vendors are, are provided through our inclusive access relationship with the bookstore. So, um, you know, we have OER kind of across the board there. Um, but, um, and, and this kind of evolved through a process. So we started out with a low cost books tag um, and we set the $40 marker. Essentially, we were following Maricopa Community College, which I think was one of the leaders in sort of this, this course marking field. And so they had set $40, we followed with $40. And that seems to have been, I think, kind of become a norm. Um, I'm not sure that that needs to be the case. We're probably gonna reevaluate that at some point. And then we kind of built things on. We kind of had a hidden Z degree uh, tag that we used because we wanted to just identify those courses that were in the Z degree. Then we added zero cost books. Then we had the inclusive access um, thing. So we brought that in. And in the process, our tags changed a little bit in the student information system. So I'll go to that now. Um, basically, when a student is looking for a course, this is uh, PeopleSoft. So it's very similar to the UTA example that um, Jessica shared. Basically, they go down to the bottom of their course search and they can look for a course attribute. Our, uh, our uh, filter is called textbook savings. And then what that does is it returns the list of courses and you can see there's a column identified as textbook savings. And there are these orange bubbles. Uh, the S is for inclusive access. Um, the L is for low cost and the Z is for zero cost. And what happens when you student hovers over the bubble is they get a little pop-up window that describes in detail what that looks like. And all of this was programmed into PeopleSoft with our, through our internal team. There are fields in PeopleSoft that can be used for this feature. Um, there's a textbook field in PeopleSoft. Um, you know, this, I think, from what I understand of talking to the team, this is kind of a, a minimal kind of coding uh, sort of project, but it, it does require some hours and, um, and, uh, and it does require a process. Um, the way that we implement this is that um, we tag the courses during the, co the scheduling process. So when um, chairs are assigning courses to faculty, um, they're also supposed to get the textbook preferences from the faculty. And then they can add the, the tags to, um, to, the, uh, to the course. So what you're looking at, if you're not familiar, don't worry about it. This is really just a kind of a sc some screenshots of PeopleSoft. Um, when you're doing the course scheduling, there's a couple of pages, a basic data page and a textbook page. And we have the tag in those two locations. On the basic data page, that's what gives you the course attribute and allows it to appear in the search. And then on the textbook page, there's a, a tag for textbooks. And this generates um, a note or an instruction that then appears in the class description. And so that, that's kind of, this is the back end process. It happens at the chair level when they're scheduling for classes. Um, and then, so as we were doing this, we, we started doing inclusive access as well. And inclusive access is a bit more um, labor intensive because you have to assign a, a fee um, to, the, to the course. Um, when we started implementing that, we, uh, the chairs got 
pretty frustrated with all the time that it was taking. So then we had the, our PeopleSoft team do a bit more development. And this actually required some additional coding. They created a, a, a page for us that allows a chair to go and bulk tag basically all of the sections in, in, in a particular course. So you can see I've searched for biology 1406 um, in a particular term. I think that's fall term. You pull up all the classes and then you can, you can assign them all the same tag, or you can go through and just tag them all in a single spreadsheet on the one page. And that makes it life a lot easier for our chairs. It's, uh, it makes the implementation of the tagging process uh, a lot smoother for them. And then I think the real benefit sort of um, to, uh, I mean, from an institutional standpoint, from my standpoint as an OER coordinator, is that I can track all this information very simply. I can pull up uh, a query or a report that gives me all of the zero cost books classes that have been tagged, all of the low cost books that have been tagged. I can see what faculty are using what books. I can reach out to them, communicate with them. Um, I can see, I can then track our numbers. So for instance, I think this is spring. Uh, these are spring numbers. And um, so you can see, you know, the number of subjects that we have with zero cost, low cost, and our inclusive access or first day program SFD, um, and then the number of students. And you can just see what's happened. I mean, basically, the inclusive access program is way bigger than anything in the others. But, um, but at any rate, I can, I can get a snapshot of kind of all of this stuff. And we are building it into a um, now into a dashboard, a Tableau dashboard that will um, make some of this data a lot uh, neater um, and kind of provide some visuals for us that we can we can use for presentations and so forth. Um, another thing that we did that I would recommend, and I, I think this goes to kind of tracking the impact of these um, programs. You know, there's there is a kind of um, I think a an assumption among a lot of educators that you know if we tag courses as zero cost or low cost or OER, students are going to flock to those sections, and I I think that's something we ought to actually measure, um, and we can. So what we did was we um, put a counter uh, in the um, in the search page so that when a student filters by textbook savings, whenever they conduct a search it captures that student's information, the time of the search, and, and then and, and what classes they were, and what search terms they were looking for. So what I found is that there were like 8,000 unique searches um, for textbook savings um, going into the spring semester. Um, interestingly, that only is two, a little over 2,000 students. So a lot of students are doing multiple searches. In fact, we found like one student had done 130 searches using the textbook savings filter. So I think this is the kind of interesting data where you can kind of begin to track um, whether students are actually using um, the tools, whether they're actually searching for books uh, that have uh, cost savings associated with them. And then we can find out, did they actually enroll in the class? And so those are the kinds of interesting questions that I think we, uh, the next step is that we need to sort of uh, go ahead and, 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 and measure that and, and see which students are choosing what. In conversations with students, I did a, um, a panel recently um, with some students, uh, HCC students who, uh, who said that they, they just really appreciate this search feature. Um, we are working on our communication strategies around this. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, are, we're, we basic, mainly what we do is we talk to advisors, enrollment officers, and make sure that they're aware of it. We do a social media campaign at the beginning of every enrollment period to kind of blast the word out about uh, the Z degree at least. And the Z degree page has some information about how to use the search tool, but you know, I think it's a process and it's kind of something that, you know, you have to kind of teach everyone about because everyone's interacting with students. And so, you know, the more 
people become just aware and accustomed to this as a feature of course searching, I think the more that that's going to filter down to students. So um, that is basically the picture from HCC. I had a couple of uh, links to resources, and I'm happy to share this uh, slide deck uh, with everyone as well. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Does anybody have any questions before we turn it over to Rebel? All right. Rebel, do you want me to share the links that you sent in the chat? Okay, I'm going to try to share and we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen now? You can, yep. Okay, can you hear me okay? Mm hmm. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to basically just talk a little bit about what we did at K State. And so here um, you can also read this in the great um, marking affordable textbooks that Jessica talked about earlier. Um, and I apologize for the background noise. Um, we have at K State, we went in and we looked mainly at the design. And so that's what you can see in our case study. We focused so heavily on the design that it actually took us like six months longer than we should have. So that's the first thing that I'm going to start with with you all and something that we're also struggling with here at the state. So I'll just um, kind of reiterate that in my um, overview is that don't focus on the design. The design so much is not um, is what is not what's important. What's important is whether or not the students can um, can understand the design and they know what you're talking about when they see it. Um, if they don't understand it, if they don't, um, if they can't recognize it, if they don't know it means zero textbook costs or low textbook um, costs, then they're not going to recognize it with it and they're not going to be able to um, use it really. So one of the things that we did at K-State was that we actually took um, that designator and we highlighted it at the top of the course schedule for the students. And so you can see um, this is from a past schedule. If you click on the open alternative textbooks that provided, you can actually see what does that mean. Uh, for us, we implemented it because we actually had a student fee attached to it. So um, the students had to understand that if they were going to take this course, they were going to pay a, what they called an open alternative um, textbook course fee. So, um, and it wasn't actually for the textbook itself, but for um, those type of courses, the money was used to go directly to the department and also to support new open and alternative textbooks created. So um, we included um, both open and what we called alternative, which were basically free textbooks within the learning management system for the students. And so if you click on the link of courses with open textbooks, it would take you to a link of all the courses um, at the university that were using open or alternative textbooks. Um, this allowed the students to quickly fill up their schedules um, with those open and alternative textbook resources and courses instead of those commercial textbooks. So they knew right away they didn't have additional costs um, for those course learning materials. And so um, I think that worked very well for our students. They were able to sort by discipline. Um, and you can also see if they had K-State 8, which was another area of icons, those were separated from our textbook icons. So there wasn't confusion for the students. Um, now I'm gonna jump over to um, Open Florida. Um, quickly before we end or go to questions, I did want to kind of discuss um, what we're doing at the state. And so we've been working for um, quite a while, over a year now, to develop a statewide um, textbook icon. And so we have a zero textbook cost icon. Uh, I apologize, my um, other device died again, so I'm having to jump back um, to this device. So um, if you could um, put the screen up to the coffee um, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Did you um did you hear that? Okay, just 
she's moving. Sorry, my my signal must be delayed. I apologize so much. Um, so can someone share the open Florida? Yeah, I can share it. Okay, sorry, I apologize. Okay. I thought it would make it. I thought I had charged it long enough, but. <laughs> oh. Okay, so this is right. interesting. Here's open Florida. Can everybody see that? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so what we've been developing here, again, um, we started with zero textbook costs. So um, we pulled together a statewide group, um, the Textbook Affordability OER Steering Committee, um, along with some Open Florida uh, participants, which are, are anyone within the state of Florida who's interested in um, open and affordable learning. Um, we looked at um, what options would we wanna pursue at the state of Florida? And um, ultimately we decided that a, le a low textbook cost icon would wait, um, that we would do a phase one um, with a zero textbook cost icon. And so that's what you see here on your screen. Um, what we did is we actually, um, I developed a survey with about 10, it was 10 different options um, for students for icons that, um, that would recommend or, would uh, would in, they would when they saw it they would instantly think this is a zero textbook cost course, um, and so we um, gathered their feedback on their preferred icons as well as the comments that they made about the designs. Um, the students clearly um, preferred a dark cover with the white text on it. Um, they preferred the word zero cost. Um, some prefer the word zero textbook cost. Um, many others preferred um, that uh, dollar sign with the strike out to clearly show that there was no cost. Um, these things um, really resonated with the students as being clear indicators that they weren't going to have to pay for a textbook for this course. Um, we developed um, this slightly modified design off of their top choice um, based on their comments and feedbacks that I just mentioned. We provided this design to the textbook affordability OER steering committee, which they approved and we've been um, supporting this design for about a year now for local use. So within that push for local use, um, we have had um, suggestions that we actually include this within our statewide um, course catalog system for all of our online courses for the state of Florida for all public post-secondary um, institutions. So that would be colleges and universities. And so we are actually working with a task work force group and I'm happy to report um, by this um, webinar, they actually have approved um, the zero textbook cost um, indicator for the statewide uh, catalog. So we are working on um, the design right now approval. <laughs> um, so they're working to approve this design or slightly modified design right now, um, a definition on what exactly does a zero textbook course um, mean um, and um, the policies to implement that into our catalog. So um, I know we're getting tight on time and we also wanted to provide some time for questions. I do apologize for my technical difficulties. Um, I was trying to make it a little interactive um, and give you some links that you guys could actually play with and go, go forward with. Um, and please at any time, don't hesitate to contact me. My email is rsalls at flbc.org. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Rebel. And no worries about the technical difficulty. That was me yesterday. <laughs> um, okay, let's see, we have some questions here. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so Jenny Parker asked, I was wondering if Nathan could describe inclusive access first day. I hadn't heard that before. Um, and it, oh, and then it looks like uh, Jessica answered with the caveat that this is mostly anti-inclusive access bias. Here's a great resource from the US Perms on the topic. But do any of our other panelists wanna kind of talk a little bit about inclusive access and kind of what that means? I mean, I guess there are several different resources here that people have plunked in, but um, but if anybody has yeah. any thoughts about it. So we did talk about at the state inclu um, potentially including an inclusive access in a low textbook cost indicator in the statewide course catalog. So that is something that we have um, talked about, but we decided that um, while it's still a budding program, we don't wanna, um, we, we're, we're not ready to kind of um, define what exactly an inclusive access program would mean for a state level. Um, and we were not able to determine um, a definite low textbook cost definition because our state board of governors currently set that at $20 per credit hour. So that was a, a little higher than our, um, our committee was willing to, 
approve. That, um, and just to give a definition, I think I put something in the comments, but basically inclusive access is a, an arrangement that the institution enters into with the bookstore where the institution agrees to bill students automatically for their textbook through a course material fee that's added to their tuition. And then the student has the option to opt out of that program if they want. Um, and then in exchange, the publishers in the bookstore provide an ebook version of that textbook directly imported into the learning management system at a reduced cost. And I think, um, you know, there's, I think the debate around this has a lot to do with sort of, well, you know, what, how much is that reduced cost? What pressures are being applied to the institutions to sort of go this direction? Is it really saving students money? You're forcing students essentially to pay up front and then opt out to get a refund. Um, is that serving the interests of the students? So there's, there's a lot of debate around it. There's been a couple of, it's a little bit controversial. There are, are some lawsuits pending uh, where students feel like, felt like the program was implemented in a way that wasn't transparent to them. And um, there are some states that are considering letter legislation right now to try to sort of make that transparency a part, part of it. But at any rate, that's the basics of the pr program. We have another question too. Um, Robert says, say more about $10 and what this fee was used for. This seems to be contradictory to the initiative. So I think this is in reference to the Kansas State initiative and the $10 student fee. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it seems contradictory, but um, the students were the, actually the ones who were um, the one in full support of it. Um, as the commit as partners, we um, went to our student leaders and we discussed um, really the sustainability of an OER pro or an open and alternative program. We're not strictly OER. We are open and alternative or we were open and alternative at K-State. So how do you support that? Um, our program was it so long in the making that we were starting to get into those um, potentials of second editions for textbooks that we had created early on in the program. And so how do we fund that model? Um, how do we keep this going? How do we ensure that not only do you get to use an open textbook um, for this um, semester, but your next student does as well? Um, and not only that, um, potentially that class that you would have had to pay that $100 textbook for, for the next semester, now that $10 that you paid this semester goes towards converting that course into an open or alternative resource. And so um, a lot of it was that it was a, it was a department enticer as well. And so um, as I mentioned, 89% of that fee did go directly to the department. And so they were used however the department saw fit as long as it met university policies. And so for so, some cases that meant that my math department didn't have to um, fire a faculty member. Um, they were able to keep that faculty member employed due to budget cuts. They didn't have to make that cut. They were able to keep that um, that faculty member employed. In another department, they were able to buy a very expensive um, microscope that they needed for the lab that all of their graduating students were complaining that they did not have access to during their learning um, time in that environment. So um, ultimately, the students were the ones who benefited in the end. And I think they saw that and recognized that as well. We have another question that says, what is the value to students to making a class as OER, or market, sorry, marking a class as OER as opposed to zero or low cost? All the information I've seen is that student concerns focus on cost, not copyright. I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I'll say that, you know, I think when, when thinking about students, the question is also of awareness. Um, so, I mean, this is not necessarily saying in favor of OER, but using an OER marking means that students have to understand what OER means as well. Um, so I don't think that using OER is necessarily, you know, student in mind, it might be institution driven. Like I said, it might, if your institution is trying to promote OER, trying to increase awareness, um, you know, OER has benefits, lots of benefits beyond just the free text. Using that marking can can go a long way institutionally, um, but you also have to ensure that that students know what it means, which is kind of the trade-off there. 
So it, it's going to probably be more on institutional uh, values rather than student uh, information in that sense. Not sure if anyone else has different thoughts on that. I think that was an interesting comment, Jessica, because it kind of points to this sort of dual purpose for course marking. Like, you know, it's to display for students the fact that their resources might be free or cheap, but it also can really help on the back end with people needing to know, um, you know, like we get a lot of pressure from our administration and from our state wondering how much our OER initiatives are actually impacting students and how much cost savings we have. And by, by actually designating a label for OER rather than just free helps you kind of get that information. Yeah, yeah, and I would say, oh, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead, Rebel, it's okay. I was gonna say on the flip side, that's probably why we have the zero textbook costs is because our, our legislation very much um, supports textbook affordability and OER, so that's important for the state. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of verbalize what I've got in my comment here for people, which is that a lot of the time institutions that use the OER label don't use it by itself. They'll use it in conjunction with a low cost or no cost label. So it'll be a designation apart from those other ones to add an extra bit of attention to courses using OER specifically and to draw attention to what this is to sort of get interest and raise awareness as others have said. So you don't have to do an either or. A lot of the time when there's a no cost label, there's also a low cost label for example. Thanks, Abby. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. We have another question or just a comment from Robert that says inclusive access uh, does save students, but it is neither low nor zero cost. Um, it forces the student's hand and the institutions support it because they receive money back from publishers. In addition, its ease and access undermines the growth of OER. So I think that does kind of speak to that tension that somebody mentioned earlier between, um, you know, they're both sort of uh, at least on paper, like working towards the same goal, but um, but one is very much driven by the publishing industry and one is very much driven by sort of like grads, oops, faculty efforts. So does anybody have any additional kind of, um, you know, things to say about, about that comment? Oh, the, the US PERG report that I dropped in the comments talks, touches on that a bit. Um, you know, they, they looked at a bunch of inclusive access contracts um, to see what it says and yeah, it, I mean, I, I didn't really want to say anything because I'm very anti-inclusive access biased. Um, you know, it is pro-publisher. You know, they say they it's it's low, but it's eliminating student choice. They have to buy through. Well, I mean, they technically can opt out, but you know, they're not really able to shop for best pricing. Um, it's discounted because the publishers are cornering the market. You know, instead of a third of the class buying new, they're getting almost all the class, um, and there's no guarantee that costs will stay low. So the U.S. Berg talk about that a lot in their report. So I'd recommend checking that out if you want um, more exploration of those kind of topics. So we've been talking a lot about IA contracts, IA contracts this week um, locally in the state. And um, one of our state representatives said that, um, so does that mean that we can implement OER contracts with our institutions? And I thought that was a brilliant idea. And perhaps somebody could help me draft um, that. Yeah, I think um, all this too, like just, I mean, the issue of cost, the question of like, what is the benefit of OER? And when I talk to, when, you know, I talk to administration that care about cost primarily, when you talk to students, that's the first thing that they really feel. But when I talk to faculty, I wanna emphasize the other benefits of OER to changing the way you teach, um, to thinking about um, the instructional resources you use as the kinds of things that are a public good that can be consumed in principle by anyone. Um, and this, this kind of, this, that kind of dialogue, I think goes beyond the cost feature and um, you know maybe it's a reason why we should emphasize OER rather than zero cost. Um, that's an argument for instance that David Wiley has made for a number of years but I, I think the zero cost has a role to play. I think there's a reason to focus on student savings uh, at least institutionally for me um, but you know I try to couple that with an emphasis on the importance of the open licensing from a faculty perspective, from a pedagogy perspective, from a, you know, from a copy left 
kind of uh, perspective. I do the same, Nathan. You know, when I we I have to you know justify ROI to keep my program going, but when I do outreach to faculty, we try to kind of make costs, you know, maybe the entry point, but all those other things are really what make OER great and what you're not going to get from publishers. You know, I like to say to faculty, think about, you know, building a resource to match your course rather than a course to match your resource. Um, and it's making those those right pedagogical decisions and customizability and things that available through OER that's not through commercial textbooks. Rebel says, if you do have to do auto rentals, do it smart and don't restrict OER in the process. Instead, show it as a preferred choice. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that's something we've struggled with in our institution is how to, you know, <laughs> make it so that opting out is easy, making it so that OER is findable in the same systems that faculty are searching for, um, for inclusive access titles. Yeah, I think that's why we're trying to go to the state level too, right? And that's what we heard from our community is that if the state saw it as an important thing, then they could push harder for it locally as well. And Abby says opt out is a, as a default model is what she's seen where students have to opt in to get them. And yeah, I think that kind of would be <laughs> more of a conscious decision, right? For students rather than having to just um, you know, opt out. Um, this is where some of the state legislation is going. Okay, yeah. Uh, that would be to a question that, that I was wondering for the panelists, um, how important do you see like the state mandate for these sorts of things and getting a course marking initiative off the ground? We don't have a state mandate and we're doing it. Um, so I don't think it's a requirement in order to get your act together, um, <laughs> if I can say it like that. Um, and also we can say that, you know, we've had some where it's, we've seen that it has been mandated, um, but the process hasn't, um, hasn't really been rolled out very well. So the problem with a lot of the legislation, um, and I say this with I don't think we would have had mark course markings at VCU without legislation. So I do think there is definitely benefit of the push if there's not that internal motivation. Um, but a lot of the legislation doesn't have, you know, the stick half. So it tells you how to do this. It doesn't tell you when implementation must be by. It doesn't tell you, you know, specifically how to do it. Um, so you know, in, in Virginia, it says it must be done, uh, you know, as, as soon as possible or something like that. Um, that's not the exact wording, but there's question of, is that mean you have to implement the course markings as soon as possible? Do you have to put them in the registration system as soon as possible? Um, you know, that, that part's not clear. So um, I think the legislation definitely helps spur people along, but at the same time, like there's, there's no, there's no guarantee is actually going to cause anything since there's no repercussions if people don't follow the legislation for the most part. That's true for what we've seen in Texas. Um, there isn't a mechanism for verifying whether those course markings are happening. Um, and so, and there's nobody who's designated whose job it is to, to sort of check that stuff. So, you know, we assume basically it's not getting checked, but I will say that, um, this so some good things about the Texas legislation is that it was coupled with the creation of an OER grant program and a biennial uh, funding mechanism for that. And so um, and then so that's been really nice because actually Texas has we've suddenly kind of seen this big statewide uh, excitement around OER and a lot of interest in this stuff. So um, you know, I feel like there, that that was actually a really a positive, a positive push. Um, we had already started marking before the legislation came out at HCC. So, um, because for in, the internal reasons I mentioned earlier, but um, but yeah, I think statewide we're seeing that it has had a had a really positive effect. That's great. Well, I see that we're a little over time. Um, so, you know, in in the service of of keeping things, keeping things on track and not keeping folks too long, I do want to wrap it up. But 
Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was a, a really informative webinar, and I think everybody learned a lot. Um, so for those of I've gotten a couple questions about slides. I know um, Jessica shared hers in the chat. Uh, Nathan, if you want to do the same, or you can just, I think I have yours by email. I can just um, send them out to the group. for, for those. I, I sent another co a new copy to you through email. Okay. Um, unfortunately, mine are on are actually PowerPoint, so I don't have a link to share, but. Oh, okay. Um, okay, yeah, we can just send that out as an attachment to the attendees. All right, well, thank you everybody for, for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And if you're in Iowa, I hope it warms up, right? <laughs> all right, have a good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thank you all.